today, I would like to introduce Dirk Pelling, founder and CEO of Work Hero and Inter Offices, and founder of PropTech Houses, on the topic, the crisis impacts on the flexible office market and co-working operators in Europe. We may have the chance also to welcome a bit later Anthony Slumber, director of the estate today. Um, but for the moment, Dirk will speak 20 minutes and then you will have 10 minutes to, um, for Q&A. So to ask your question, you have this uh, Q&A um, um, possibility. And uh, please, Dirk, the microphone is yours. The stage is yours, so you can share your screen now. Awesome, you can go. Okay, thank you very much. We have a very diverse audience uh, today. Um, and um, I'm going to try to make a point, first of all, with uh, the data, uh, a lot of data, because we need to measure um, correctly if you want to uh, see some future trends in uh, in this space. So what is the state of the market, so global-wise and EU-wise, where well, we have more than 35,000 flexible workspaces, uh, representing more than 40 million uh, square meters, and we have about 7,000 um, flexible workspaces in Europe, which is expected to rise to 14,000 by 2025, with a growth of 10%, or let's say 13% year on year, that's global, and 12% in the European market, and a presentation of uh, about 26 billion in market value. Um, we have seen that in the last five years, locations have grown with 205% and operators have grown with 138%. At the same time, a very important evolution, 40% of the amount comes from largest corp large uh, companies and, uh, and corporates. And in some spaces or in some uh, areas, zonal countries, the take up has been, uh, by flex space has been up to 60%. Um, good to know about the, the statistics of the people that, that work there. We have 65% of co-workers are less than 40 years old. On average, each location has 185 members. 22% are IT uh, professionals, which is the largest chunk here uh, in a general way of speaking. And then we see that 65% of new co-workings are new businesses. The top five here have 14% of market shares. So we talk then about really big companies such as an IVG, Regis, etc. cetera. Um, and in a, in a more uh, financial way, the rent that all these co-workings are paying is representing 40% of their costs. And I will get back to that uh, later. The salaries are about 16%. And already in the fiscal year 2018, 58% uh, are, uh, were struggling with profitability. Now, when you look at what, what's happening in Europe, uh, you see that about 64% of EU companies are using flexible office space services in one way or another. Now, another 19% in Europe are considering in the near future, and 65% uh, in Europe consider it as a, a positive um, product, being in uh, or working in flexible office space with co-workings. And I have here for you the three main benefits for for European companies to use flexible office space. For 71% is the ability to adapt to the needs. 42% reducing real estate costs, and 37% increased employee engagement and uh, satisfaction. Now, getting immediately to where we are uh, now, let's talk about the impact. Well, the impact um, that, are, that we are currently feeling throughout the landscape of the um, serviced office space depends on the product and the inventory mix of these uh, co-working spaces. You have, grosso modo, uh, you have four types of products, which I will, would call the private offices, the open space membership, uh, and then the virtual office offerings and other services, and um, last but not least, the meeting room. So the impact on the private offices, as we see it, uh, is a mitigated one. Um, it, it, it's most less, mostly less impacted when you compare it to the open space uh, revenue, because there it's less than 5% of normal. On the other hand, when we look at the virtual office services, we are seeing an increased demand and we are seeing also an increased uh, sales. So in the revenue for the meeting room then is again 5%, uh, is again less than 5% of normal, which is completely understandable given the current measures that, uh, that we have. So we have also done a bit of surveys into the recovery expectations um, to the levels uh, towards pre-COVID um, period. And you see that in a general way, 
is expected that in Q1 2021, we will reach again pre-COVID levels in private office. It is not the case for the open space memberships and the meeting room where we expect to only uh, go to pre-COVID levels in uh, Q2 of 2021. And for the virtual office, I think all these services will have a good future uh, for the next uh, 12 to, to 18 months. The second uh, thing that defines the impact is also the client mix, because you have a mix of startups, which right now have cash issues, risk of bankruptcy, you have independent professionals, who look mostly at the value of the community and the network. You have the SMEs with, uh, who are going for agility and cost savings. And then we have corporates um, who see co co-working as part of a larger and long-term strategy. Those, this, this mix is important uh, when you look at each location uh, individually. And of course, if you have a lot of startups and scale-ups uh, in, in your uh, client mix, then you're more at risk at this moment. Uh, if you have more corporates in your mix, then we are, you will be less uh, um, impacted. What we are seeing also in the current impact throughout the landscape is back practices between operators and landlords. Because we all know that if some people like you, you read a lot in the media, start about not paying the rent, not being able to, to pay the rent, we need to look for solutions. We only do this, and this is a general observation throughout the European landscape, we do this on, uh, uh, only on a individual basis and certainly not just with free passes. So it's also always very limited. And, and there we see four uh, possibilities, which is blend and extend uh, for contracts or granting rent fee periods with an added value or the value added pro rata in future payments and a uh, temporary rent reduction or simply uh, rent free. The basic message here is that operators and landlords need to work together. And that's what we also see happening um, throughout uh, the landscape. Now, what about this near future uh, impact? Um, because in my opinion, and we see it in a, in a lot of the surveys that we do, um, we have the COVID-19, which is really becoming a catalyst for an increased use of flexible uh, working. First of all, let's look at a very special one. Um, that's the 64% of businesses that expect the impacts will last uh, maximum six months. This is a European one um, and is a very big, big difference, I think, with our friends in, in the United States. Uh, and we, I, I think I feel it at least, it's a bit uh, subjective what I'm, I'm not going to say, but I think that we have here a lot of measures uh, where we, uh, in Europe, in a lot of countries, where we have the, the possibility of um, uh, putting people in, in a uh, system uh, where the government is paying for 70% uh, of, their, of their salary. So this makes uh, it for quite some companies uh, easier to uh, also deal uh, financially with other obligations such as um, the rent. Five other um, important uh, measures in this impact is 24% uh, of businesses say that disaster recovery plans will become a priority. Uh, and 83% uh, of businesses say that they will continue remote working or to, uh, to promote uh, remote working um, during, uh, during the next uh, months. On a each one longer term, you see that 33% of businesses will look at bringing flexibility into their lease um, contracts. And 26% will increase remote working. Remote working does not mean home working. I will get back to that in, uh, in a second. And then the last of my data that I, will, that I want to share here with you um, is that at least uh, you have 82% uh, of workers who would like to work remotely at least one day uh, per week. Then you have 53% of the workers who say that productivity has not changed by home working, which is very um, positive, um, I think. Given now the fact that uh, if you add to that, that 71% of millennials do not want to commute more than 30 times, uh, um, you see that something is going to happen. And uh, that's why I always say that the COVID-19 is really accelerating a trend um, that was already uh, going on in, um, in real estate. The impact on company policies, there we see uh, five different uh, possibilities. That so companies are starting to re-evaluate their uh, real estate and workplace strategy. They are bringing more flex into the real estate portfolio, which is a tendency that was already going on for the last five, six um, years. That will now accelerate implementation of remote working. This is something as a direct consequence from um, the COVID-19. And then this next one also uh, that a lot of the, the corporates are 
are considering allowing five to 10% of the staff to permanently work from home. This is an eye opener because it means that, uh, again, a lot of space uh, will be coming available in those, uh, in those companies. So when we talk about the future of flexible workspace post COVID, um, we see a very big role uh, for PropTech. Uh, and I will explain that uh, more in detail um, for us. The COVID-19 accelerates an exponential change that was already on the way and the purpose of the office has already changed. Homeworking will not be prevalent, that's for sure, uh, although that you can read sometimes in the media that, um, that the office is dead, <laughs> that it's the end of co-working. It's certainly not the case. Uh, the, the office will instead will be the place where uh, the action or the interaction person to person uh, will take place and we will use the, uh, the office probably in a uh, uh, somewhat different uh, way, in a sense that we will use it uh, in function of the type and of the activity and the location uh, of the activity. Remote working will drastically increase. Why? Because we are able to reduce commuting times and we allow people to work where and when they want. Working where and when they want is not exactly home. It could be perfectly any flexible office space uh, location uh, in the world, which is like near home because let's not forget that still 73 percent of the people prefer not to work um, from home last but not least um, health and hygiene will impart will be a part of the image of a, of a building now what does it mean in for the flex space operators uh, we're, we're talking uh, about uh, more of more than thirty five thousand uh, in the world well i think they're going to thrive because uh, certainly they have pressure to take measures post COVID 19 but there's also the effect of granularity in the market. Uh, we are going to see more and more flex spaces almost everywhere, from the big cities, but also in the smallest towns that uh, you, can, you can imagine. We will also see a tendency towards more private offices and less open space. That's also a direct consequence of COVID-19. The human-related tasks will be at the core of everything uh, that we will be doing in an office environment. For the operators themselves, we, see, we will see new business types that will be focused on shared models. And this is where uh, mechanism, uh, mechanisms come in, uh, where landlords and flexible space operators are going to work together or have to work together. Mergers and acquisitions, health and hygiene, I think it's, uh, it's a very normal uh, thing. So where are we now uh, currently um, in, in, in terms of landlords and flex space operators? Well, the operators are squeezed, you know, squeezed because they need to, to receive uh, the money from their tenants or subtenants, as we would call it, um, but they also need to pay the landlord. So in cases where we have like a catastrophe that or disaster for a certain number of the clients um, that is happening, um, there the landlords have, in fact, they have three choices. A landlord can you know, outsource the service to an operator in the future, uh, but he leaves them a lot of money on the table and he has no power in case of crisis, which is happening now. He can also become himself an operator, but then he needs to adapt to new roles, hire new talent, uh, because being an operator of a flexible workspace is not the same as being the owner of, uh, of a uh, building. Um, then, to, um, to give you an example of, of how we do that, um, that's one of my companies work you know, well, that's also a project company. We are working together with uh, the owners of, um, uh, of companies where we organize co-working within their own building. So we have them monetize a new office space and at the same time, better work together through programs of, uh, of innovation. This is an example of Procter & Gamble where we open uh, uh, and in, in a lot of other uh, large corporates in, in throughout Europe, we open these, uh, these co-working flexible office uh, space locations. So in terms of technology, uh, for me in Europe, it's like technology, the EU Green Deal, sustainability were extremely um, important. And there was never a moment more important for public than now and in the next two years. Uh, technology, data, hospitality, know your customer, that, that will be expertises that will determine the workspaces um, of the future. And then you have the second set of elements, which is HVAC, well-being, health, connectivity, agility. Technical components of the office that will determine behavior and choices of clients and workspaces um, of the future. Let me give you an example of what PropTech can do. You see here a certain number of um, PropTech European um, PropTech uh, companies in uh, several, um, let's say, um, 
segments uh, of, of the market. Uh, we, we, when we talk prop tech, we always talk about finance and invest, design, build, market, transact, manage and operate, live and work. And you see that more and more of these will have a direct impact, um, thanks to COVID also, uh, an accelerated impact on what we can do um, in terms of developing better methods, uh, developing better buildings, and most of all, creating better um, workspaces. And that's why uh, we are very happy to see that uh, the European Commission has launched a brand new, uh, it has been notified, uh, announced this week, a brand new funding program activating billions uh, of euros to invest in specifically um, scale-ups and startups throughout Europe. And of course, a large chunk of that will go into PropTech, scale-up and startups um, in the very near future because the program is starting right now. Basically, it will help get funding to the most promising scale-ups in Europe where uh, one, million of, one million investment from a private investor will be doubled with one million investment from a pension fund or an insurance company uh, on which a certain guarantee will be given by the European uh, Investment Bank. So, this is uh, what I wanted to tell you, the role uh, very shortly of the Alliance of Proptic Associations in what is going to happen now in the next, I think, two years uh, in Proptic is that we have in uh, Europe, we have uh, more than 24, 25 national associations who are uh, helping all those Proptic companies uh, to get funding, uh, to deploy on the market, to find new clients. And that's we are, well, what we are doing in PropTech House to support everyone to get access to funding and to get access to, uh, to the markets. You will see here um, some, of, uh, some of these. That was, dear Sophie, what I wanted to, to uh, share with all of you um, today. Um, and I leave uh, the mic to you. Thank you, dear. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm really pleased to uh, tell everyone that Anthony Slumbers is uh, here. Oh, that's great. So, Anthony, if you want to say a few words, I don't know if you heard about the uh, listen to the uh, the dear presentation, but go ahead. I I, I just caught, I just caught the the last part of it. I'm glad to have uh, got here. I actually just got off another call with um, a, a rather wonderful call actually with some people in the in Washington, London, and, um, and Q Kuwait, and, um, and Miami, actually. And to be honest, I think I've just had the, 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 the most um, optimistic hour of the, of, the, of the whole year, looking at what um, the, the upside of this ob obvious, obvious downside. And we were, di we were discussing how what is going on at the moment is is really acting like a, f a forcing function to to propel to propel not just prop tech but the wi wider society on by five or ten years because we're having to we're having to adopt some ideas and some processes and some thinking now that we've frankly been able to just give lip service to over the last the last few years. So if you think about it in terms of um, in in terms of say, say the the office the office market it's going to be an absolute imperative for owners of uh, uh, office assets to prove to their customers which are going to be anyone who walks into their building that their building is healthy and is not going to kill them and that sounds sounds dramatic but we are definitely going to find people very very nervous when we are all eventually unlocked, people are going to be very nervous about the built environment. They're going to be worried about where they go to. They're going to be worried about whether they're going to catch anything, be infected by anything, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what that, of course, means is that the imperative to create better spaces is absolute. It's, abs it's abs absolute in moral terms, but it's also absolute in finance financial terms, because there's going to be a huge amount of value destruction in spaces that don't have a reputation for being able to protect the people that, that are in them. So there's a real incentive from so many different ways to, 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 to think about sustainability, to think about health, to think about wellness, and to think about the great linking 
that is technology which needs to needs to integrate and aggregate and make all these things all these things work together so there's a fantastically optimistic upside of as i say this, this obvious downside which is going to propel potentially um the prop tech sector en enormously so in terms of you know if you're in the sector the first thing obviously everyone has to do is you have to survive you know because there is a difference between what is going to happen today the last month and the next x number of months and thank cross fingers that x is single figures not any, not anything longer low single figures to what is going to happen longer longer term in the short term there's obviously an awful lot of people in in, cri in crisis mode and working out what they're going to do but once once the whole industry looks at what they have to do the difference in the market going forward as opposed to previous real estate downturns is that in previous real estate downturns the imperative was to save money you had to cut capex cut expenses cut costs cut everything in the world we're going into you are not going to be able to cut your way to success you're not going to be able to cut your way out of this you're going to have to invest to create better spaces because you will not get people into your into your shop into your apartment into your office building into your anything unless you can persuade them that these are health, healthy buildings owned by people who have taken taken care so in the short term there's obviously this like heart attack moment but in terms of the prop tech industry i think you need to think of it as line your line yourself up for moving actually a lo a lot faster because this is this is adding an extra layer of seriousness to to everything this isn't oh well we're, let's have a bit of te technology or the, what prop tech shall i buy you know the thing we've heard the last the last couple of years almost like prop tech and tech is all, all a bit of fun it's a it's an ancillary it's cream on the top of the cake this stuff is now absolutely imperative and things have to move have to move fast so in particular anything anything that digitizes processes that enables people to work remotely because this remote thing and this distributed nature of working is going to be a big thing over over the next well it's going to be a big big thing from now on because having been forced to work in a distributed manner for several months people are going to get used to it and they're not going to give it they're not going to give it all up so tools to give you access to everything you need you see it's a funny thing i mean for instance I, i've worked like this for 20 odd years so i'm used to everything being in the cloud it doesn't matter where i am i can get access to everything i need a friend of mine a friend of mine a friend of mine worked worked for a, a very large um fashion fashion company and when we were told over here everyone had to go home they they had, had a corporate heart attack because nothing worked outside of their office they literally could not function for about 10 days anything outside of their office so basically the company just cut uh, just stopped now obviously those types of companies are going to have to very rapidly if they haven't already done it move to being more um more digital more cloud-based more access to anything you want and and anywhere so there's so any anything in technology terms which gives people access to the information they need when and wherever they need it is is really important and then of course anything that that is involved with health and wellness in a build, building sustainability materiality in a building so, so literally the the materials that things are made made out out of and a lot of emphasis on a presentation layer of making information data has has now to become much more open because everyone is going to i want to know the information about how's that should i go to that building or should i go to that that building i need need data so you're going to find a massive upswell of stuff in inverted commas is going to have have to happen really quickly so if you can make it through the sort of heart attack phase and then and then laser like focus on value propositions around around um digitalizing processes health wellness sustainability then i think you'll be um very well uh, very well set up for the rest of the rest of the year 
Interesting. Time is running out, and I think we have time for one question. Uh, Dirk, Anthony, you choose. Um, so you mentioned that five to ten percent of work uh, workforce will work permanently from home and free up capacity in office business. Um, but wouldn't that easily be compensated by the increase of square meter per employee due to the new distancing rules slash more individual offices? Um, I can, okay, <laughs> I, I will give you first a short answer. Uh, in the short term, yes, but in the long term, not, not at all. In the short term, as long as we need to cope with these specific measures, yes, but that will take until the next vaccine is there. And, and after that, we, we will change again. That, that's for sure. That, that's how we behave as, as, as human beings. Uh, so in the, in the long term, no, it will not. But it has an, its implications because if it moves from 5 to 10 to 15, then you will have a lot of, again, extra square meters that will become available and that companies should think about am I going to downsize or am I going to do something smart with it and maybe rent it out to other companies, which is then again, shared, uh, shared spaces um, to offer. And I, I, I can completely agree with that. I actually, um, in, in, the, in the short term, yes, distant, distancing, we're, we're obviously going to do that. When we start going back into offices, you're going to find maybe 10, 20 percent of people within a building will go back to start with and they slowly work their way up from there. But the, long, the, the idea that long term, we're going to be thinking about office spaces as less dense is, is com completely wrong. Because the, the only reason to go to an office in the future, when, when you are set up to work anywhere you want, the reason to go to an office is to do human things. The only point in going to an office is to go and do the collaborative, the human thing. So the design, the imagination, the empathy, the designing new products and services. And that has to be done tight and, and collaboratively. We are, not going to, we are not going to adapt to this new world by saying everyone's going to stay two, two, meet, two meters apart. We have to solve the, the, the problem because the point of space is to catalyze human, human skills. Now, what you will find, I think everybody, every company is going to take less space. So the absolute, a, absolute gross demand for office space at a set level, if you, if you discount size, uh, growing size of uh, uh, an economy, will be people will take less space, but they will pay more for it. So I think what you'll find is there's going to be where people used to take a thousand square meters, they're going to end up taking 500 square meters, but pay the equivalent of 750 square, uh, the equivalent of if they were pay, taking 750, because they're going to need better space. These, these spaces are going to have to be better. It's going to be expensive to create healthy, healthy buildings. It, it just is. But we, need, we do need less, less space. So what you're going to find is from, a, from a, a, a landlord's point of view, there's going to be an increasing gap between high value spaces and low value spaces. The mere fact that it's a building is not where the value is. It's what can that building do for me as, as, a, as a customer. And you will find people, there will be people who will operate better spaces. And a lot, this, is, this is the great opportunity for the whole, the whole flex market because they have an incredible incentive to get, to get this right. Because if the flex industry does not create healthy spaces, the industry will be over. So the incentive to create the very best spaces will actually be from the flex office providers. And so I'm pretty certain you're gonna find increasingly small numbers of companies taking leases at all. Those leases that they take will be shorter and they will balance between longer leases, a lot of flex space and a lot of remote working because by then they would have been set up operationally, culturally to, to work in that way. So it's very much think of everything as less but better. Yeah, I fully agree with you, uh, Anthony. It's, uh, it, it's really a tendency that we are going to see in the flexible office space. You will have much more demand 
for flexible office space, not only in terms of um, the room is uh, flexible or the space itself, but also in uh, the flexibility that, that as a providers uh, you can offer in terms of the contract. Uh, and because that also is going to be uh, very important. And that in itself will have again a very large impact on the valuation of buildings because that's not the subject for today, but it will be important. And talking about uh, flexibility of the contractors, um, with the standpoint of the tenants, what kind of flexibility they will ask in their lease? Well, the, the first thing that they will ask is like, uh, is the length, uh, of course, uh, the conditions uh, at which they are, will be able to grow and to downsize, which is for the flex office operator, uh, yeah, it's his task to, to, manage, uh, to manage that. Uh, and the flexibility, of course, in uh, what kind of services can you uh, provide us with? Because it's not, in, when you have understood how flexible office space works, then you know that it's not just about, okay, there's an office, uh, there's a key and step in. No, there's a variety. Of, of services that can be offered that are already being offered right now, but in the future that go could go way way further and way more um, comprehensive um, than than we have it now because now we have like the services of what you you know the reception services etc virtual office services um, and you have the IT services connectivity etc. Uh, we can think about so many new services that that people uh, will be asking in terms of. Um, to adapt, in, to, to enable them to adapt better to flexible um, uh, circumstances or to be flexible. Yeah, I think, I think this is, a, it, it is so important to not, to not get, get into the mindset that this is, oh, well, people aren't going to sign a long lease, therefore the value is a lot, a lot less. The point is people are, people, it, it's not a case of necessary, people need space to, space to work. The point is they don't know how much space they're going to need in a year's time, in two years' time, and it will go up and down, and they will need different types of spaces. It's the overall flexibility of, going back to my favorite phrase, of having space that provides them with the services they need when they need them, that, that really matters. The, the, they're not, good companies are not going anywhere just because they haven't signed a, signed, signed a long lease. If you, pro, if you can provide the services and the, the environment that suits a company, they're not going anywhere. Great, interesting. Um, I think that we, uh, we're gonna end this, uh, this session. Thanks, Dirk, thanks, Anthony, for, for your time, for, for joining us. Uh, it was a great moment. Thank you all for uh, meeting us every afternoon at 4 p.m. Paris time. And uh, I would say see you tomorrow. And uh, of course, be safe at home. Thank you very much and thank you Anthony. Thank you Sophie. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Sophie. <laughs>